Let us continue standing for the reading of God's word. It is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. It is located on page 671 of the church Bibles. Proverbs chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For the length of days and years of life and peace, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. You will find favor, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh, and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Brothers and sisters, this is the reading of God's holy, inspired, infallible word. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would uh, speak to us uh, through the reading and the preaching of your word, and may the name of Christ ever be praised. Amen. You may be seated. It's a privilege uh, to, to be here this morning. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Stamper. I uh, come from Lancaster City uh, with my wife, Kelsey, and our four children. Uh, we, uh, we love living in Lancaster. Uh, it's a beautiful county, and my wife, uh, she's an accountant there in the city, and I'm a teacher at Veritas Academy which is a Christian classical uh, school in Leola. And uh, it's, it's there I actually have the, the privilege of teaching uh, the book of Proverbs. So when, when Tom called me, I believe it was Wednesday evening, I, I kind of knew right away I wanted to preach on the Proverbs. I didn't know which chapter yet. And I was reading through, and, and chapter 3 uh, really, really struck me uh, Wednesday evening. And... You know, when we, when we think about the Proverbs, we think about like short, pithy, sometimes disjointed sayings that perhaps communicate a bit of like folk wisdom, right? And you know, some of the Proverbs, they are those short, isolated, what we call bicolas or tricolas, right? Two or three line uh, Proverbs. But the section we read today, it, it's, it's a little bit longer. It's the third of 10 parental appeals throughout the book of Proverbs, uh, appeal from a father to a son. And rather than settling on the idea that Proverbs are pithy bits of folk wisdom, I, I really like the way uh, Pastor Timothy Keller defines Proverbs. He says, a proverb is a poetic, terse, vivid, thought-provoking saying that conveys a world of truth in a few words, right? They express truth that is obvious after the fact, but in a non-obvious way. They take time to digest. And, you know, however, to, to sit on a few Proverbs and digest them for a while isn't necessarily attractive to us when we can all pick up one of these and find an answer immediately to a difficult question. But the Proverbs ask something else of us. There's no quick solution to glean wisdom. And growth and wisdom, it isn't ordinarily speedy, right? It's a gradual process of trusting a person, Jesus Christ. The wisdom of God personified 
And as we grow by examining our experiences and lives through the lens of Scripture, we repent and we learn to rely on God more deeply. So today, as we look at this passage, and I'm not going to be able to to look at it exhaustively, but I just want to look at three points that I see in our passage today. I want to look at the wisdom essentials, the wisdom disciplines, and the wisdom benefits. The first two points will be a little bit longer. The third point will be shorter. First, the wisdom essentials. What are the basics that we see in our passage? What do we need to know to understand what the proverb is telling us? Well, he says, my son, do not forget my teaching. What teaching? What is wisdom? I've heard wisdom described this way. I'm sure you've heard it. Knowledge is knowing the facts of life. Wisdom is discerning how to apply the facts to life. Right. Kathleen Nielsen, in her book on the Proverbs, which is excellent, she says that wisdom is, quote, God-given insight how to live in God's world. Wisdom, it's not the same as knowledge. It's not just knowing. It's, it's having this wisdom permeated into our souls, exercised into our muscle memory, right, through years of, of godly disciplines, humility, openness to self-examination. This is why just earlier in Proverbs 1, it says, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice, and she will make her words known to you. In other words, it's it's there, ready to be kneaded into the, the dough of our souls and our hearts if we humbly seek wisdom throughout our lives. Because you cannot just gain it overnight to face a crisis. Which is also why Proverbs 1 says, Because I have called to you and you've refused to listen, have stretched out my hand, and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I will also laugh at your calamity. Right? We cannot just gain wisdom quickly overnight to navigate life's problems. Now, lest we be mistaken to think that we could somehow just gain wisdom through some sort of method apart from the Lord. Verse 5 in our passage says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him. I was thinking uh, just yesterday, it's an odd sermon title, right? Wisdom, I could have entitled it Wisdom for the Mind, Wisdom for the Intellect, but I didn't. This was intentional. Wisdom for the heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Well, the Bible's understanding and conception of the human heart is far from simplistic. There's an honest complexity to it. The heart, according to the Bible, it's, it's the steering wheel of every human being. It's the real you. All the ways the Bible refers to the inner person, right? The, our mind, emotions, our will, rationality, feelings, intellect, desires, they're all summed up in this one term in the Bible, heart. And while the scripture speaks of the heart as a unified object, it describes it three-dimensionally. We are thinking, feeling, and choosing beings. Throughout the scripture, you'll find verses that speak of the human heart in cognitive terms, that is, thinking. There are verses that speak of the human heart in volitional terms, right? Choosing or having a will. And there are many verses that speak of the human heart in affective terms, right? Desiring, feelings, emotions. So to trust in the Lord with all your heart is not some pithy, trite saying. This is far from folk wisdom. What Proverbs describes is a lifetime of dying to ourselves, our insecurities, our selfish desires, our own wills, to have our wills subservient to the Lord's will. It's describing us as we subjugate our hearts to the trust of the Lord. Proverbs says, Be not wise in your own eyes, Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing to your flesh and a refreshment to your bones. 
So we must also understand the fear of the Lord. And, you know, note there's actually healing when our lives are given to the trust of the Lord, right? There's real psychological and spiritual, emotional benefit to living life dependent on God rather than trying to live trusting in ourselves. This makes for an emotionally healthy person, a person of strong, faithful spirituality. Fish cannot live out of water, and neither can we live life cut off from the stream of living water and find true health drinking out of filthy hewn cisterns. Health and wisdom are often associated in the book of Proverbs with trust in and fear of the Lord. The word fear in Hebrew, it communicates either a sense of, of terror or a sense of awe and worship, depending on the context. So if you've read the book of Jonah, this word is used to describe the sailor's fearful terror during the storm which then transforms into fearful worship of God after the storm is divinely calmed. And in the Hebrew, it's using the same word in each instance. You see, we all fear. It's folly when our fear is directed at man or our circumstance. In fact, it's destructive. Think of the sailors in the storm. Proverbs 29 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. So when we fear the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom. It's the proper response. Rather than destruction, Proverbs 14 says that the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Our fear is in awe of God's greatness. And there's a reason Wise reverence and fear leads to wise living. Wise reverence and fear leads to wise living. Deuteronomy 10, 12 states, What does the Lord your God require of you? To fear the Lord your God. To walk in his ways. To love him. Serve the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. What we fear, we worship. We inevitably obey what we fear. And a fear of God actually leads to obedience, walking in his ways. It's a recognized reverence of the king. Whatever we fear, we worship. We'll actually orient our lives around our fears. Um, when I was a child, I loved the old... Frankenstein film, the black and white, you know, Boris, Boris Karloff. And uh, I was trying to get my nine-year-old son to watch it, and he was like, no, too scary. So probably way too young. But fear plays a big theme in that film, right? And the townspeople, they're being ravaged by Frankenstein's monster. What do they do? They, they flee in fear. And what must Dr. Frankenstein do? He must stop running and face his fear this monster he created. And that's what God's calling us to do in receiving his wisdom. That we would stop running from all that hidden junk in our hearts, the fears to which we cling, and that we would face them and offer them on the altar to him. Because there's no terror that haunts us that can withstand the weight of his holy terror. I love that line from the Chronicles of Narnia when Susan is talking to Mr. Beaver. You remember that? And she learns that King Aslan is a great lion. And Susan says, I thought she was a man. Or I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And how does Mr. Beaver respond? Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. You see, 
the outworking of proper fear, toward, which is towards God, is that it drives out the fear of man. It drives out the fear of our circumstance, and it reorients our lives towards wisdom. Perfect love casts out all fear. Right? This is why Proverbs associates wise people with those who have a calm spirit. I heard one preacher say that you know, wise people, they have an inner unassailable poise. So no matter what the situation, there's a kind of calm and poise and confidence. And that's why they usually make good choices. According to this passage, how do we get to this place? This leads to my next point, the wisdom disciplines. What disciplines do we see in this passage that cultivates wisdom? First, you could probably all guess this, we must grow in our knowledge of God. We must grow in our knowledge of God's word and trust in it. We must grow in our knowledge of God's word and our trust in his word. Proverbs 3.3 3 says, let not, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And the influence of Deuteronomy 6 is evident here. Right? Deuteronomy 6 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your might, and these words shall be on your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house. Bind them as a, a sign on your hand. You see, the Bible commends these external practices to, to, to work God's word into our internal being, right? So we, we read God's word, we meditate on it, we discuss it, we, we speak it in our liturgy, we sing it in our worship services, we, we talk about God's words with, with others every way that we can have it internalized into our hearts through these external practices and liturgies. Think about Psalm 1, right? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Right? It's the one who meditates. And in Hebrew, that means like to, to actually to murmur, either to speak it aloud or to internally kind of ponder it. Right? This is those who read God's word. They ponder on it. They, they think about how to apply it to particular circumstances. They seek it for comfort. They accept its correction and so on. This is why we have all of these disciplines to permeate God's wisdom into our hearts. Right? Bible studies, prayer meetings, counseling, fellowship meals, right? anything to work it into our lives. It's also should note that term scoffer there in Psalm 1, it speaks of someone who refuses instruction or correction, whose life is rejecting God's word and his wisdom. And this person is throughout the Proverbs, right? The fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge, but fools do what? They despise wisdom and instruction. Their lives are marked by turmoil, they're not open to self-examination or correction. And this is the theme contrasted throughout the book of Proverbs. The fool ignores God's word. The wise accept it. They meditate on it. They fear him. They trust him with all their heart. So first, we must grow in our knowledge of God's word and trust in it. Second, we must know how to process our suffering. Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. It was also Lewis who said something like, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. He shouts to us in our pains. Our hearts will respond to suffering in some way. Our hearts will respond to suffering in a way that leads to wisdom or to folly. 
In suffering, we must understand what is happening behind the trial, even when, and it's most often, we don't understand the trial itself. Because there's a process here that God works to produce, to produce results in his children whom he loves. Think of Paul in, in Romans 5 or James in the first chapter of his epistle. Right? Suffering has a telos, a goal, a purpose. Another way to say this is that we fear God. And we trust the Lord with all our heart, and we do not lean on our own understanding in difficult times. Um, my family, we, we, we enjoy time in, in Gettysburg. My family is really into the American Civil War. My, my son is a Civil War buff. Uh, there, was, there was one time that we were in Gettysburg. We were actually walking through the National Cemetery and uh, we just got, we just walked past the area there in Evergreen Cemetery where, you know, uh, President Lincoln gave his famous address. And I heard this curious sound and I, I looked up at one of the monuments. Now, if you've been to the National Cemetery, I think it's the New York Monument. There's a monument, it's a long pillar, and on the top is this iron angel. And what I saw next to the angel was a woman in a bucket truck with a blowtorch. And she was applying these flames to the angel. And the angel was getting really hot, lighting up, and it was burning off all the dross. And it struck me, fire, that metaphor in the scripture, that metaphor of testing, purifying. And so often this is how God purifies us. He brings us through the fire. God purified his people in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 8, the Lord states that he tested his people to quote, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. Deuteronomy 8 says that know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. When tested, when suffering, we're humbled. It produces steadfastness, Paul and James says. It purifies our faith and our character. There's a process of maturity and wisdom that the Holy Spirit works to conform our hearts to the character of Jesus Christ. When suffering, we are being led by Jesus to wisdom and righteousness. Be encouraged in trials, the proverb says because it's here where his love is manifesting as he grows us. So we need to know God's word and trust in it. We need to know how to process our suffering. The third discipline that I see here in this passage, this discipline of wisdom, is generosity. Pro Proverbs 3.9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Now, at first, this might seem like an odd fit. However, think about this. An inordinate love of money, uh, otherwise known as idolatry, is driven by some sort of fear, right? A fear that I'm, I'm going to lose my security, I'm going to lose my possessions, I'm going to lose pleasures, wh whatever. There's a fear that's driving this. And Proverbs warns us that the fool is someone who did not choose the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 129. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And in other words, what I'm saying here, there's no way around it. Someone who is wise will be someone marked by the practice of generosity. They will not fear the cost of generosity because they fear the Lord alone. They see their possessions as something to be stewarded in service to God. These gifts are given to serve the giver, not to be accumulated for ourselves. Did anyone here read the story just, I think it was just last week, of the two Pennsylvania churches that were cited by their local government for violating their zoning code right over in Montgomery County? Did anyone see that? Okay, well, um, 
Their violation, their violation was given because they were offering meals, collecting and distributing essentials. They were uh, hosting food pantries. They were providing mental health services. So uh, I read the violation and actually stated this, quote, it is the opinion of this office that the use of the property has changed and by definition is more than that of a church, end quote. Uh, in, in the articles that were being covered on this, one of the church leaders uh, did an interview with several of the papers, and they responded that being generous is part of being a church, right? It, it's, it's actually uh, pretty essential. Um, and that the borough doesn't have the right to define what a church is and what a church does, right? And if you've read the Westminster Confession of Faith, we agree. Chapter 23, we, we agree. Amen. So uh, kudos to those churches who were marked by generosity. Now, when, when I was reading the online article, I, you know, I did the one thing that you're not really supposed to do with online articles. I went right down to the comment section. I'm like, what, what do people think of? And, you know, ordinarily when there's something with a church, you, you're going to read critical comments about Christians and churches. Not here. Not here. The comments were supportive of the churches, were thankful for the churches, and were critical of the local government. Because people saw the wisdom and the beauty of this generosity of Christians. And their comments were largely in favor and expressed their, their disagreement with the, with the government. And this leads to my, my third and final point, the wisdom benefits. First is beauty. Beauty. The readers of that article saw something beautiful. It was attractive. They saw wisdom marked by generosity pointing them towards shalom. The Hebrew word for wisdom, hokfa, it, it actually means skill or craftsmanship. So uh, in the book of Exodus, when the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to people to, to build the, the, furnishing, the furniture for the tabernacle, right? He gives them wisdom. He gives them skill to create something beautiful. This is why Peter Lightheart wrote, wisdom is skill not only in art, but in life. Wisdom involves skill in doing what is fitting and in producing results that are beautiful, end quote. So if you read about the aesthetics in the temple, I mean, it, it was beautiful. That took wisdom. And in a similar fashion, a life lived in wisdom is a beautiful life. It's a life that is lived in truth. It corresponds to what is good. And it is attractive. The second benefit is, and this is tied to the first, it's evangelistic. As the watching world sees this beauty of wisdom that comes from God alone. Verse 4, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. One scholar, Old Testament scholar, when reflecting on this verse, writes, that this entire chapter engages in a kind of evangelism of the most profound nature, the, the full richness of the life of faith, and this includes the submission of the intellectual life and material things to God, respect for other persons, and above all, an eagerness to embrace the right way of living in God's world, i.e. wisdom. Commentator says it offers the promise of personal wholeness and confidence in the face of an uncertain future. It's attractive to see this sort of beauty paired with the benefits of this health and wholeness that we discussed earlier as wisdom is lived out in the life of a believer and then it becomes a witness to Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge as Colossians 2 says. They can see it. They can see it in our worship services, in our ministries, in the teachings of Scripture, and in the lives of faithful and generous believers. And the last benefit is the peace of God. Proverbs 3 says, Let your heart keep my commandments for the length of days and years of life, and peace they add to you. The word used here for peace is, of course, that word shalom. Shalom. 
In Hebrew, shalom means well-being, but it extends far beyond than just simple wellness, right? This is what Adam and Eve lost in the garden. It's a peace that you have in relationships, in society, in the world, and it's a state of flourishing. Make no mistake about it, shalom can only come from Jesus Christ. Perfect love drives out all fear. Proverbs associates wise people with those who have a calm, peaceful spirit because they have this shalom, that inner, unassailable, calm confidence. And our faith, that reverent fear of the Lord above all things, brings this shalom into our lives. We fear and trust in God because he is the one worthy of that position in our lives. He is the one who sent Jesus to put to death our sin and folly on the cross to justify us, to make us right before God. According to Paul, then we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. So you see, we can only have this sort of peace if we trust in and fear the Lord. That is, we receive and rest upon Jesus alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. We can only have wisdom, true wisdom, if we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. And the scriptures say the gospel of Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1. Who greater should we fear? Whose word is more trustworthy? There is only one worthy of having our hearts subjugated under to conform our lives around. There is only one whose wisdom is from above. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you. We thank you for your work of not only making us and creating us and sustaining us, but redeeming us, uh, for making us uh, pure and clean through your blood. Uh, that the Father looks down on us and sees covenantally not our sin, but sees the very righteousness of Christ, that we are loved to the very degree that you are loved, Jesus, by your Father. We praise you for this, and we do ask for your wisdom to permeate our hearts as we live in such a confusing world, a world that increasingly needs, uh, requires us to have more and more wisdom to navigate. Uh, Lord, we pray that this wisdom, we would then steward it. We would serve others, and we would be good witnesses, ambassadors of this grace. And it's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen.